It was around 10 a.m. I was sitting at my desk in the office, looking at a photograph I held in my hands. In it were a woman hugging a seven-year-old girl, my wife Sarah and daughter Emma, smiling happily and waving. I missed them terribly. It had been almost half a year since I saw them in person. Although we often call each other via video, deep down I longed for their warm, live embraces. I've been working as a ranger in a national park for 10 years. My work begins with the first warm days of spring and continues until autumn when the park fills with visitors wanting to enjoy nature. Another season is now drawing to a close, just two more weeks, and I'll be able to return home. My thoughts were interrupted by a loud bang. I looked around, my partner was sitting next to me, he slammed his hand on the table, holding a smartphone in his hand, and gesticulating furiously with the other. These damn fools they've lost again you know Jack. He turned to me. I really believed in them thought this time I'd make a killing. That damn coefficient was really good. Too good. Damn I bet too much. He continued to shout angrily, cursing the entire team, the coach, and their ancestors. I decided to calm him down. Calm down, Bob. You know the bosses don't approve of betting. If they find out, you'll be in trouble. Oh, sorry. He looked around apprehensively and said quieter. Lately, I've only had losses and it's driving me crazy. Yesterday we played poker at Old Dylan's, imagine. Not a single damn set in the game, at most two pairs in the evening. Damn what's happening. I shook my head disapprovingly, not endorsing my friend's hobby. He then pulled out a pack of snacks, opened them, and started eating, washing them down with coffee. I looked at him. His appearance had been not so great lately. Dark circles under his eyes, a protruding belly, and a double chin, but he still remained energetic. That's what he was loved for at work, for his restless and cheerful nature. John's daily feast, which had become almost a tradition, was interrupted by a knock. Patrick stood in the door. He looked disapprovingly at Bob, who was brushing snack crumbs off himself, and told us we were called for a meeting. Then he left. I got up, helping Bob clean up, then we went to the conference room, when we entered, there were already a lot of people there, all gathered around the TV, listening intently. They were watching the news. A beautiful anchor with a worried face was delivering the latest events. Dear viewers, we are facing a significant challenge. A powerful cyclone is inexorably approaching our state. In this regard, local authorities have already announced the need for evacuation in a number of cities. According to the latest meteorological data, Wind speed and precipitation intensity may reach critical values, creating potentially dangerous conditions for residents of our communities. Citizens in the zone of the expected impact are strongly urged to follow the instructions of local authorities and refrain from travel unless it is directly related to the immediate evacuation. Please stay safe, keep up to date with updates, and do not neglect precautions. We will continue to inform you of developments as new information becomes available. Having listened to the announcer, our boss turned to us. You heard the news. This morning we got a call from the meteorological station warning of worsening weather and recommended closing the park. I've already ordered a closure notice to be put up, but there may still be people in the park. Your task is to patrol and warn visitors and ensure evacuation. Do you understand the task? We nodded in agreement and dispersed. Each employee responsible for their own section of the forest, Bob and I were responsible for the most remote. I began to get ready, we loaded the equipment into our pickup, and set off. After driving about 20 miles, we stopped at a gravel parking lot, beyond were the forest and hills. I looked at the sky. It was already beginning to cloud over. We had to walk two routes to save time and cover everything. So we decided to split up. We set off, and soon a fork appeared before us. I looked at my cell phone. It had no signal here. We had a radio, but it couldn't reach the base. A powerful radio was in the car and in case of anything, getting to it was the first priority. After checking the connection, Bob and I went our separate ways. Walking along the winding trail in the hilly forest, I felt the wind becoming more persistent and colder. Tall trees around me bent under its pressure, creating a rustling of leaves that grew louder every minute. The sky was increasingly covered with dark clouds, heralding the approaching storm. Strangely, there were no tourists in the park today. Usually, there's always someone here, but apparently, the sense of bad weather scared them off. Only, I was alone, 
my steps echoing in the silence of the forest. Suddenly, something unusual in the sky caught my attention. A plane, majestically and frighteningly, was falling to the ground. It was too low, and it seemed its wings flapped helplessly in the air. My heart froze with anxiety. The plane disappeared behind the nearest hill, and without a second thought, I rushed there. On the way, I contacted Bob via the radio. Bob, old pal, can you hear me? Yes, Jack. Did you also see the falling plane? I saw it as it was descending. It must have crashed near your area. Yes, it's not far from me. I'm heading to the site. You go back to the truck and call for backup, by the way. Did you find any tourists? No, Jack, not a single soul here, Bob replied. All right then, stay in touch, I said. Take care, buddy. As soon as I alert our guys, I'll head your way. I turned off the radio and continued on. About 10 minutes later, I saw a column of smoke ahead. There was about a mile left to go. As I made my way through thick bushes, I heard a terrible scream in the distance. It seemed like someone was experiencing immense pain and was very frightened. I hastened and soon saw the trail of the plane crash. As it fell, it apparently hit and broke all the trees in its path, making it likely that it had crashed harshly. I was right. Ahead on a small clearing lay the wrecked plane. It was a small turboprop aircraft with two engines and propellers. There was smoke coming from the engines, but no signs of fire. I sped up, ready to provide first aid. But as I approached the plane, a horrific sight unfolded before me. Beside it, where the rear side door was, lay two bodies. They were severely mutilated, but I could make out that they might have been Latinos. Wounds covered their entire bodies, one missing a chunk of flesh from his neck, as if bitten by some beast, the other had a similar wound on his thigh. I almost felt sick. Their faces were scarred with deep cuts, all indicating they died not from the plane crash, but from an attack by some creature. Realizing this, I looked around in fear, whatever it was, it could still be nearby. But there was no one around. Only the strong wind blew, bending the trees. I drew my pistol and continued the inspection. Carefully walking past the bodies, I looked into the cabin. There, I found large wooden crates scattered around the cabin. One was overturned, its lid broken, and packets of white powder had spilled out. One torn open, and the powder spread across the floor. The plane was possibly transporting drugs, I thought, and continued searching. In the tail, I found a large broken cage, its bars bent as if someone had forcefully broken out. Apparently during the flight, some creature had escaped from it and attacked the crew. I went into the pilot's cabin where a man lay in one of the seats, a tree trunk protruding from his chest, having pierced the windshield. Was there anyone else alive? I exited the plane and contacted Bob on the radio, telling him what had happened. He was very surprised, asking me in detail about the incident. After the conversation, I continued searching. I noticed two sets of footprints leading away from the plane, and animal tracks all around. I decided to follow them and set off. As I walked through the forest, the daylight gradually faded. Twilight covered the woods, and every shadow now seemed deeper, more mysterious. The wind picked up, driving ahead of it the harbingers of the storm, dark, looming clouds. I turned on my flashlight and bent lower, afraid of losing the tracks. I felt every gust of wind that blew through my clothes and made the trees around me rustle and creak. Each step on the soft forest ground seemed louder than usual, and my heart beat so loudly I could hear it in my ears. I kept looking over my shoulder, but only saw dense thickets and flickering shadows between the trees. I wonder if Bob had called for backup. Judging by the time, they should be arriving soon. I quickly grabbed the radio to contact him, feeling growing anxiety. Pressing the call button, I expected to hear his voice, but only static noise responded. Hey, can you hear me? I tried again, but the radio only buzzed back, bringing neither response nor comfort. My heart beat faster with worry. What happened? Why isn't he answering? Thoughts raced through my mind. Pressing the button again, I tried to call him, but all my attempts were drowned in the silent noise of the radio. Suddenly, I felt that I was being watched. It wasn't just a premonition, I instinctively felt someone's presence. My eyes strained to see in the darkness, but they couldn't make out anything. Anxiety hung in the air, intensified by the wind's noise and the distant rumble of thunder. I quickened my pace, trying not to lose sight of the tracks on the ground. The forest became darker, and I felt raindrops begin to fall on my face. 
Every rustle made me flinch. My thoughts revolved around one thing. Who's there? Friend or foe? I pondered whether I should turn back, but then thought those people might need help. Yes, they were smugglers, but still humans. My duty dictated that I should continue the search. Soon the sky closed in, and it began to rain. Hastily, I pulled a raincoat from my backpack and put it on, trying to shield myself from the pouring rain as quickly as possible. Raindrops drummed on the fabric, adding a background noise to the already resonant forest. The ground under my feet became soft and wet. My boots heavily sunk into the moist earth with each step, as if sinking into thick mud. I tried to move faster, but the wet soil resisted, slowing my steps. The tracks on the ground began to fade, becoming less noticeable under the rain streams. The bad weather engulfing the forest was taking its toll. I realized I needed to hurry if I wanted to find them. And then, amidst the roar of the wind and the sound of falling water, I heard a scream. It came from afar but was clear enough to direct me. I ran towards the sound, overcoming the resistance of the mud and obstructing branches. My heart pounded in unison with my rapid steps. All my senses were heightened. I felt every raindrop, every gust of wind on my face. Instinctively, I drew my pistol from its holster, holding it ready. Not knowing what to expect, I continued running towards the source of the scream. Thoughts of what might have happened, and the potential danger that could lie ahead, flashed through my mind. Approaching closer, I saw a Latino man standing in the middle of the forest, in a state of fear. He looked around as if fearing something invisible and threatening. Surveying the surroundings, I found nothing unusual, except for the two of us. As I got closer, his face lit up with joy. He rushed towards me, repeating the word, help. As soon as he got near, the man immediately hid behind me, still looking around. Terror was evident in his eyes, and he kept repeating the words, hombre lobo. These words, spoken with such fear, made me tense up. What could have scared this man so much? What had he seen in those woods? Just as I heard rustling in the bushes, the Latino man beside me started to emit piercing screams, throwing out unintelligible words in Spanish. I tried to calm him down, while firmly holding my pistol, ready for any turn of events. The rain intensified, making visibility increasingly difficult. The noise in the bushes shifted left, then right. It seemed as though something was moving around us at incredible speed. I tried to follow every rustle, turning in different directions, but the location of the creature was impossible to accurately determine. My heart pounded with fear and excitement. Then it happened. The creature, with inhuman speed, burst out of the bushes right at us. It all happened so quickly that I didn't even have time to react. I saw only a humanoid silhouette. With a sudden blow, it grabbed the man and carried him off into the depths of the forest. I was left standing alone, paralyzed by shock and disbelief at what had just occurred. The silence was suddenly broken by a long, piercing howl emanating from the bushes. This sound made my blood run cold. I realized I had encountered something whose nature and power surpassed anything I had faced before. My mind raced with thousands of thoughts about what to do next. Part of me wanted to run away, but I couldn't ignore the source of that terrifying howl. Gathering my courage, I slowly headed towards the bushes from where the sound had come. But as soon as I approached, something powerful struck me in the chest. The blow was so strong it knocked the wind out of me. I fell on my back, feeling the cold raindrops beating against my face. I tried to grab my pistol, but in vain. The weapon had been knocked out of my hands and rolled away. I tried to gather my strength when suddenly it appeared above me. The creature was hard to describe in words. Its body was covered in thick fur and its face was a horrifying mix of human, ape, and wolf features, with something reminiscent of a bat. Its eyes glowed with an incredible yellow light, full of rage and madness, and blood dripped from its mouth. Lying there, under the gaze of this monster, I felt that my end was near. Everything seemed so unreal, but the fear I experienced was absolutely real. Suddenly, a loud gunshot sounded from the side. Someone had fired a flare, brightly illuminating the sky. Its light reflected off the wet leaves and raindrops. The creature, which had just threatened to tear me apart, started and began nervously looking around. It seemed as surprised as I was. With incredible speed, it retreated, disappearing into the dense forest. I tried to get up, 
but my body refused to obey. I felt every gust of wind whipping my face, mixing with the cold raindrops. Suddenly, a man leaned over me. He extended his hand, and grabbing it, I somehow managed to get on my feet. How are you feeling? He asked me, his voice urgent and concerned. I looked around, picked up my flashlight and pistol, which had fallen nearby. Under the flashlight's beam, I could finally see his face. He was about 45 years old, a blonde, tall man. He wore glasses, which he was now wiping from the raindrops streaming down the lenses. My name is David Miller, he introduced himself. I asked what he was doing in the forest, but in response, David just shrugged ambiguously, evading a direct answer. This seemed suspicious to me, but at the moment, my main priority was to get out of here. I tried to contact Bob through the radio again, but all I heard in response was silence. I tried to recall where I had come from and headed in that direction, but suddenly, my path was blocked. We were surrounded. Numerous powerful flashlights blindingly shone in my face, and Kalashnikov rifles were pointed at me. My heart froze with fear. Drop the weapon, someone shouted loudly from the darkness. I saw no other option and complied. One of the men approached me closer, and before I could understand anything, I felt a sharp pain in my head from a butt stroke. Everything around became blurred, and I lost consciousness, falling into the wet, cold ground of the forest. When I came to, the first thing I felt was the tight ropes binding my hands. Darkness enveloped everything around, and it took me a few moments to adapt to the gloom. Looking around, I realized I was in a tent. The air was stuffy and smelled of smoke. Mr. Miller was sitting next to me, his hands also tied. From his look, I understood that he had already come to his senses and was assessing the situation. Outside the tent, I heard the crackle of a fire, and through the thin fabric, I felt the raindrops continuously beating on its surface. I tried to talk to Miller to understand what was going on and what our chances were of getting out of here. But before I could utter a word, voices carried over the noise of the rain and the crackling fire. They spoke in Spanish and seemed to be having a lively conversation. It became clear to me that we were not alone in this forest and that we were being held by no ordinary people. I asked what was happening. Mr. Miller sighed, his face looking tired and worried in the dim light penetrating the tent. We are captured, he began slowly. We've fallen into a trap set by smugglers. It seems they think we might interfere with their operation or know too much. They might execute us. After his words, I wondered how he knew so much. I pointed this out to him, to which he said, All right, I'll tell my story. Miller began. His voice was calm, but I sensed a note of fatigue. It happened a couple of years ago. I was working as a botany professor at the University of California, Berkeley. My specialization was tropical plants. As part of a research project, I often visited various parts of Latin America. During that period, while I was in Oaxaca, Mexico, I happened to wander into a secluded village, deep hidden in the jungles. It was a place where civilization had not yet penetrated. The tribe living there turned out to be surprisingly friendly. They warmly welcomed me, allowing me to study the local flora and immerse myself in their unique culture. What intrigued me most were their beliefs and rituals. One day they took me to an ancient temple, hidden in the heart of the jungle. It was a truly impressive sight. The temple reminded me of the majestic structures of the Incas. The walls were decorated with ancient paintings and drawings, telling the myths and legends of the tribe. But the most astonishing was the depiction of their main deity, a creature with the body of a man and the head of a wolf. This image was repeated in different parts of the temple, hinting at its central importance in their culture. Miller paused, a reflective gleam appeared in his eyes, as if he was transported back to that distant and mysterious moment in his life. This deity, Miller continued, his voice growing softer, was truly frightening. The tribe called it Tecolotl, which in their language meant Night Hunter. According to their beliefs, it was a creature with mighty powers, capable of taking the form of both a human and a wolf. According to the legend, Tecolotl was both a protector and avenger. On full moon nights, it supposedly emerged from its temple to guard the village from evil spirits and enemies. But its protection had a price. It was said to demand sacrifices, and if not satisfied, the werewolf could turn into a ruthless killer. The temple walls depicted it in various scenes, standing on two legs, surrounded by a circle of fire, and on all fours, lunging at its prey. Its eyes were always depicted shining yellow, 
and its teeth were sharp and bloody. Day by day, I delved into the study of the frescoes in the temple, striving to decipher each symbol, each image associated with Tecolotl. My fascination did not go unnoticed, and one day the tribal chief noticed my interest. He approached me and said he wanted to show me this god. I was stunned. Did they really believe he was real? I thought. But the chief seemed absolutely serious and confident in his words. He led me to the outskirts of the village where the priestess lived. I had never been to that part of the village before, as I had always been forbidden to enter there. This place was shrouded in mystery and reverence. The priestess's dwelling was separated from the rest of the village, surrounded by various talismans and symbols. The air was filled with a sense of something ancient and mystical. When we entered, the priestess sat in the center of the room, surrounded by strange artifacts and religious symbols. Wisdom and knowledge of secrets inaccessible to mere mortals were evident in her eyes. The chief explained my interest in Tecolotl to her, and she nodded as if understanding something significant. She led me through the village, and soon we arrived at the entrance to a small stone-built temple. Climbing up the stone staircase, I found myself in a kind of arena, covered with sand. In the center of this arena, I saw a creature that at first glance seemed to have sprung from the darkest of my nightmares. I instinctively wiped my glasses, not believing my eyes. Before me was a creature, hunched over and gnawing on a goat's skull. Its appearance was terrifying and yet mesmerizing. It was covered in fur and had the head of a wolf, but the body of a human or even an ape. When it noticed us, its movement slowed down and it slowly turned its head towards us. For a moment, I thought I saw a flicker of joy in its eyes at the sight of the priestess. The creature pricked up its ears and grinned in a smile that was nonetheless terrifying. I stood motionless, trying to comprehend how this was possible. The priestess slowly and dignifiedly descended into the arena, and then something astonishing happened. The creature, which had just seemed so threatening and fearsome, ran up to her and began to nuzzle her, like a huge but obedient pet. I watched this scene in complete bewilderment, my gaze shifting to the chief. Noticing my astonishment, he explained, she is his mother, and he is her son. I couldn't believe my ears and asked him again if she had really given birth to this creature. My knowledge of biology and genetics screamed at the impossibility of such a phenomenon. No mutations could transform a human being into what I saw before me. But the chief nodded, confirming his words. I felt reality, as I had always believed in it, beginning to blur. This was a moment where myths and legends clashed with the scientific understanding of the world. But in front of my eyes was undeniable evidence of something incomprehensible, something I could not explain with any scientific theory. Days passed, and I spent each one observing this amazing creature. I began to feed it, trying to establish contact. At first it was wild and unpredictable, but gradually it seemed to start getting used to me. Its behavior was reminiscent of a wolf, cautious and vigilant, yet curious. Over time, it began to allow me closer. I cautiously approached it, spoke to it in a soft, soothing voice, sometimes even trying to stroke its fur. At some moments, I felt like a unique bond was being established between us. But despite these moments of seeming trust, I never forgot that I was facing a real wild beast. Its eyes always harbored unpredictability, and its movements remained quick and sharp. I understood that at any moment, its instincts could take over and it could behave completely unpredictably. This continued until a tragedy occurred. The priestess died, falling from a cliff. After her tragic death, a dark time descended upon the village. She was not just a spiritual leader, but, as I realized, a link between the village and the creature. They considered their god, Tecolotl. Her loss shocked everyone, but it most profoundly affected Tecolotl's behavior. He became much more aggressive and unpredictable, began to howl and growl more frequently. One day, when a local came to feed Tecolotl, the creature attacked and mauled him. This became a turning point in the village's attitude towards the creature. They decided it was a sign that their god demanded sacrifices. They began sending people to it. Day by day, the creature killed them. I could no longer stay silent, witnessing the deaths of innocent people. I liked these people, their culture, and way of life. I couldn't accept what was happening. I tried to talk to the chief, trying to convince him it was wrong, that there must be another way to appease Tecolotl. 
but my words found no resonance. In their eyes, I was an outsider who didn't understand their traditions and beliefs. I decided to steal him. I knew this decision would change my life forever, Miller continued. I used my knowledge of drugs to sedate the creature. Local bandits whom I hired helped me with this. I don't know what the village's reaction was after our disappearance, but we quickly and silently transported the creature to a hidden airstrip. My goal was to take it to the US for further study. I understood that it couldn't be done legally, so I had to resort to the services of local smugglers. Perhaps that was my biggest mistake. When we were loading the creature onto the plane, it suddenly woke up. But to my surprise, it behaved calmly, as if it understood what was happening. Four other people were on board with me. They were dealing with their cargo. We took off, and I thought everything was going according to plan. We had already crossed the border, and everything seemed calm until one of the smugglers decided to have some fun. I don't know why he wasn't afraid of Tecolotl. He took out a packet of cocaine and offered it to the creature. I tried to stop him, but another smuggler, laughing, pointed his gun at me. When Tecolotl swallowed the drug, something in him changed. He seemed to grow in size, his eyes lit up like lanterns, and he let out a powerful roar. Then the smugglers really got scared. One of them shot, but the creature was unfazed. It forcefully bent the cage and broke out. Panic and a fight for survival ensued. The pilot, seeing what was happening, decided to make a landing. He preferred to risk crashing rather than become Tecolotl's prey. I hid behind boxes, hoping I wouldn't be noticed, and it seemed I was lucky. Soon the plane crash landed, one pilot died, the other jumped out and ran away. Tecolotl breaking out the twisted door dragged out the bodies and began devouring them, biting off pieces from each, then disappeared into the forest. I followed the fleeing pilot. That's when I met you. I used a flare gun that scared off the beast but, unfortunately, attracted the attention of drug traffickers. And here I am, tied up in this tent, telling you all this. Listening to this incredible story, I felt a mixture of disbelief and amazement. It sounded like a plot from a horror movie, not a real-life story. But the worry in Miller's eyes told me he was speaking the truth. Nevertheless, what troubled me most was that I hadn't noticed the presence of a drug trafficker's base in my park. How could they have hidden so skillfully? It raised many questions about the security and reliability of my work in the park. I pondered this, realizing that despite the terrifying power of the creature, people could be far more dangerous. The drug traffickers now holding us captive were unpredictable and cruel, and what they would decide to do with us next was utterly unclear. This thought made me feel even more helpless and anxious. We sat in the cramped tent, listening to the wind and rain noise, when suddenly there was a commotion outside, sounds of an argument, voices raised and shouting. One of the bandits suddenly pulled back the tent fabric and led us outside. The cold wind and downpour hit us with renewed force feeling like being in the middle of a sea storm. Wet clothes clung to my body, and the wind made me shiver. We were led to a wooden shelter where a fire burned, around which a group of people sat. The firelight flickered on their faces, casting long shadows. I felt like I was in another world, among strangers, in an incomprehensible situation, under the scrutinizing gaze of people who could decide our fate. When thunder boomed, it shook me to the core, but the real shock for me wasn't from the lightning, but from what I saw before me. Among the group of arguing people, I recognized a familiar face. It was Bob, my partner, the man I knew better than anyone. Thoughts raced through my head, connecting in a chain of events that, until this moment, had seemed incomprehensible to me. Now I understood why Bob hadn't responded to my radio calls after my message about the drugs on the plane. Now I understood how drug traffickers had been able to hide so successfully in my park. But one question nagged at me. Why had Bob done this? Why had he got involved with these people? The answer seemed simple. Perhaps he had lost a large sum of money, and this was his way out of the situation. But this knowledge only deepened my sadness and disappointment. I couldn't believe that my longtime colleague and friend had been drawn into such a dark story. When we were brought to Bob and the gang leader, I saw Bob shamefully look at me. He lowered his head and quietly said, Sorry, old pal. I did all I could. I found no words in response. A storm of disappointment and betrayal raged inside me. I didn't plead with him to intervene on my behalf. 
a feeling of profound disappointment spread within me, deeply shaking my faith in people. The gang leader, seizing the moment when everyone around was absorbed in the argument and noise, pulled out a pistol and pointed it at us. Bob turned away, unable to meet my eyes. At that moment, I thought of my family, how in a couple of weeks I was supposed to meet them. These thoughts of protection and love for my family filled me, leaving little room for fear or anger. Standing in front of the pistol barrel, I realized how suddenly and cruelly someone's dreams and hopes could be cut short. The life I knew and loved and the people dear to me could disappear in an instant because of others' decisions and mistakes. It was a bitter realization, but at the same time, it gave me the strength to face danger with dignity. When the leader unexpectedly turned the gun barrel towards Miller, the latter simply closed his eyes, resignedly awaiting his fate. A gunshot rang out, and Miller fell lifelessly to the ground. I couldn't hold back and shouted, You bastard! At that very moment, a furious howl echoed in the air, almost simultaneously with my cry. The bandits, gripped by panic, started shouting, Hombre Lobo! While their leader anxiously looked around. Suddenly, something with incredible speed burst under the shelter, ruthlessly crushing everything in its path. It moved so fast that people couldn't react in time. There were cries and gunshots all around. I seized the moment of chaos, darted to the side, and ducked. Under the shelter, pure chaos erupted. People in panic were screaming. The air was filled with the smell of blood, and gunshots were ringing out everywhere. The creature, like a deadly shadow vortex, continued its merciless killing spree. I lay on the ground, trying to remain unnoticed, while madness reigned around me. In the darkness, illuminated only by the flickers from the campfire and flashes of gunshots, the scene appeared apocalyptic. I realized that my life hung by a thread, and with each passing second, the chances of survival grew slimmer. Suddenly, a lifeless body fell beside me. It was Bob. He looked at me with a plea in his eyes, blood pouring from his chest, creating a dark stain on the ground. It was friendly fire. In the panic and chouse, the bandits had started shooting at each other. I crawled towards Bob, trying to understand what he wanted to tell me. He whispered hoarsely, his words barely reaching my ears. I leaned closer to his face, and with his last strength, he grabbed my shirt and whispered, Run, Jack. After those words, he went limp, and his hand slackened. I called his name, shook him, but Bob no longer responded. At that moment, the realization hit me that my friend, with whom I had spent so many years together, faced numerous trials, and who, despite the betrayal, remained a part of my life, was gone forever. Tears welled up involuntarily in my eyes. All the noise and chaos around seemed to recede, leaving me alone with my grief and loss. I sat next to his body, lost in my thoughts, when suddenly I realized that I needed to act. Bob's words, run Jack, echoed in my mind as a call to action. I got up, quickly surveyed my surroundings, and searched for a way to escape amidst the madness and chaos. Deep down, I knew I had to get out of there alive, so that all these sacrifices and losses wouldn't be in vain. Gradually regaining my senses, I headed westward. Soon, I stumbled upon a familiar trail and followed it until I reached the place where my car was parked. To my surprise, my colleagues were already waiting for me there. It turned out that when I stopped communicating, a search party was sent after me. Seeing me in an exhausted and battered state, they immediately rushed me to the hospital. On the way, I recounted everything that had happened. The incident became known to the police and other authorities, and my words found confirmation in their investigations. Later, I came to say goodbye to the park before leaving for my city. Standing at the forest edge, I suddenly heard a howl. It came from a distance, deep within the woods. I swear, it sounded like the howl of a werewolf. Perhaps it was a new inhabitant of these parts. This sound reminded me of all the mysteries and secrets that nature holds, and that the world is full of unexplored and frightening phenomena. Story 2 My name is Jack and I've spent the last 10 years working in a national park. My journey to this job was not easy and full of twists and turns. Initially, I graduated from the University of California with a degree in English philology, after which I worked in manufacturing for some time, servicing equipment and working on the assembly line. However, 
a series of family losses made me reconsider my life priorities. I left my job at the factory, used my savings to volunteer at a local botanical garden, and eventually enrolled in a seasonal school in Rangeley, Colorado. I experienced firsthand that spending time outdoors was much better for mental health than working in a dusty, windowless factory. For many years of working in the national park, I rarely encountered anything supernatural or mysterious, although many people love such stories. However, one day, I truly had to confront an unusual phenomenon. During one of my regular night patrols, as the cool air gently brushed my face while I walked between the tall pine trees, I suddenly stopped, noticing something unusual. Lights flickering in the distance were moving at an incredible speed, and seemed utterly chaotic, unlike anything I had ever seen before. I watched their dance until they vanished on the horizon, captivated by their mysterious movement. These strange lights continued to appear almost every night for the next week. An inexplicable feeling that something unexplainable was happening here haunted me. After sharing my observation with my ranger colleagues, I inquired if they had encountered similar phenomena in other national parks. Their responses only deepened my confusion. It turned out that such lights had been seen in other places, but only at night, and no one could definitively explain what they were. With each passing day, the mystery weighed heavier on my shoulders. I spent nights gazing into the dark sky, awaiting their return, driven by a thirst to unravel this enigma. My determination knew no bounds, and I resolved not to rest until I had investigated this phenomenon as thoroughly as possible, even if it meant venturing deep into the heart of the park. Leaving camp on a cloudy morning, I felt the heaviness of the air saturated with pre-rain scents. The forest seemed to close in around me, creating a secluded space between the tall trees, their long shadows stretching across the ground. For hours, I followed faint markings, leading me until I stumbled upon a series of unusual tracks. These prints didn't resemble anything I had seen before. They belonged to a creature that walked on two legs, but had unusually elongated feet, as if its owner was dragging them. With each step I took, following this path, my heart pounded harder and harder. Suddenly, I came upon a horrifying sight. Before me lay the torn carcass of a deer, its body mutilated and partially consumed. Overwhelmed by a sense of horror, I nonetheless refused to retreat. Something hunted in these woods, and I was determined to find out what it was, despite the growing sense of danger. Continuing deeper into the forest, I encountered even more victims, animal bodies, some left untouched, while others were torn apart, dismembered, or even charred. The air was heavy with the smell of death, making breathing difficult and penetrating. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me, like a predator responsible for these atrocities, lurking in the shadows, waiting for me to let my guard down. Despite all my apprehensions, I pressed on, firmly intent on uncovering the truth. Finally, I emerged into a small clearing, where sunlight filtered through the treetops. Before me lay a scene straight out of a nightmare. The ground had been scorched to blackness, and in it were two deep pits. A chill ran down my spine at the mere thought of what had transpired here. As the sun began to set, shrouding the forest in darkness, I made the fateful decision to stay the night. Though it seemed reckless, my desire to learn what hunted in these woods compelled me to take this step. I chose a spot at the edge of the clearing, hoping to discover the source of all these horrors. The night was cold and silent, and the darkness felt almost tangible. I took cover at the base of a tree, my senses sharpened to the utmost, listening to every rustle, ready to detect any signs of life. Hours dragged on slowly, and I began to doubt the success of my wait when suddenly, the same lights appeared in the sky above a distant mountain peak. Their otherworldly glow illuminated the forest with a terrifying light that was impossible to look away from. The lights seemed to be beckoning me, luring me closer. And despite the fear mixed with determination, I decided to follow their ethereal glow, moving towards the mountain. As I approached it, I began to hear strange mechanical sounds, resembling the grinding of gears or the hum of unfamiliar machinery. The forest seemed to shiver in response to these sounds, and the animals panicked, fleeing from the mountain and the source of these noises. My heart was pounding furiously, but I continued to move towards these mechanical sounds. The sounds grew louder with each step. The air was filled with the dense odor of smoke, 
the acrid scent of scorched earth and charred flesh. It felt like entering a post-apocalyptic zone where every element of the environment screamed of recent tragedy. However, my desire to uncover the mystery was stronger than fear, urging me to venture further into this ominous place. I stood at the base of the mountain, aware that I would need to climb to its summit to confront the unknown. It was a daunting task, but I was too far from home to stop or retreat. The ascent proved to be grueling, the rocky slope became treacherous, made even more slippery by recent rain, and riddled with hidden dangers. After an exhausting climb to the top, with every muscle protesting from fatigue and sweat streaming down my face, I was forced to stop and catch my breath. My heart was pounding as if it wanted to break free from my chest, but I knew I couldn't afford a long rest. The strange lights continued their mysterious dance overhead, pulling me closer to the truth. Reaching the summit, I encountered a sight that defied explanation. The lights, as it turned out, were luminescent flying objects of unknown nature. They hovered in the air, emitting a strange green gas that slowly descended to the ground like deadly mist, destroying animals and scorching all vegetation beneath them. The scene below was simultaneously terrifying and mesmerizing. I couldn't tear my gaze away, captivated by this mystical spectacle. The smell of the gas was so overpowering that when it reached me, my vision began to blur and my legs barely held me up. I lost consciousness, succumbing to the toxic fumes. The world around me disappeared, leaving me in a state of unconsciousness. When I woke up after the fainting spell, I felt a severe headache and noticed that it was difficult to focus. Trying to recall the events that brought me here, I found my memories blurred and fragmented, like pieces of a terrifying dream. Nevertheless, I remembered the lights, those strange, otherworldly lights that had become the key to an unknown mystery. Suddenly, I realized that I was no longer on the mountaintop. Instead, I found myself in dense undergrowth, lying on damp ground. The smell of the gas had disappeared, replaced by the earthy scents of the forest. Struggling with every movement, I discovered that my limbs were weak and barely supporting me. My mind was consumed by a single goal to find my way back to the ranger station. I needed to share what I had seen and experienced, to warn my colleagues about the hidden threats lurking in the shadows. Pushing through the thick underbrush, my thoughts revolved around the other rangers with whom I had shared stories of the mysterious lights. I wondered if they had encountered the same as I had, and if they were searching for answers about the lights and the strange creatures haunting the park. If so, why had they been silent about it? Or perhaps their warnings had fallen on deaf ears? or were their stories lost, whispered away into the forest's secrets. I was determined not to let my own story fade away in the same manner. Despite fatigue and weakness, I continued to move forward. As the sun began to set, I stumbled upon a narrow, winding trail. I followed it desperately, searching for any signs of civilization, any confirmation that I was heading in the right direction. The trail led me deeper into the forest realm where shadows grew denser and more oppressive with every step. After a while, I realized I had become lost. The forest, which had previously felt familiar, now seemed alien and unpredictable. I felt that the forest had somehow changed, becoming something else. Tree branches appeared twisted like gnarled fingers, reaching out to grasp me, and rustles in the bushes sounded like whispers or faint laughter. This transformation was not just physical, it seemed that the very atmosphere of the forest had become darker and more foreboding. I wondered if it was connected to what I had experienced on the mountain, or if my mind was playing tricks on me due to exhaustion and stress. Suddenly finding myself in the epicenter of an inexplicable nightmare, I began to question my true location. My gaze swept through the surrounding darkness, which seemed to come alive, extending its cold tendrils to envelop me. Anxiety grew with each passing minute. I felt like I had become prey to an invisible predator lurking in the shadows. My heart pounded furiously as I quickened my pace, trying to escape the unknown threat. A low guttural growl reached my ears, seemingly coming from underground. Something massive crashed through the underbrush, and a tree toppled not far from me, prompting me to panic and run. The growling grew louder and closer, but I didn't dare to look back, desperate to escape. The darkness closed around me so tightly that I failed to notice the steep slope in front of me. I stumbled and tumbled down, hitting the ground and rocks, 
The pain was sharp, but I managed to get back on my feet. The growling, to my relief, subsided. Apparently, the predator had retreated. Determined to rest for a moment, I started to look around for a way out of this unfamiliar part of the forest. Gazing at the sky, I was struck by the extraordinary beauty of the stars, which seemed brighter and closer than ever before. It was the most astonishing night sky I had ever seen. However, the strangest thing was the complete absence of sounds. The forest seemed dead. There was no bird song, no rustling of leaves, no sounds of living nature. This unnatural silence filled the atmosphere with a sense of unease and isolation. I realized that it was important to remain calm and composed to find a way out of this unforeseen situation. Recognizing that the forest held many natural signs that could help with orientation, I began to carefully inspect the surrounding environment for clues on trees, in the soil, and on the ground. However, to my surprise, I found nothing useful. Everything around me appeared the same as before, and yet entirely different. As deep darkness fell, I realized that I couldn't do without artificial lighting. Fortunately, I had a LED flashlight in my pocket. Once I turned it on, the surrounding world revealed itself to me in unexpected light. Everything around me seemed strange. The trees had an unusual shape, the leaves were distorted, and the trunks were twisted into unfamiliar bends. Exhausted from endless wandering, I decided to take a short break to gather my strength despite the pain in my back and legs. I knew I needed to keep moving. The surrounding world was completely unfamiliar and filled with unease. I realized that I couldn't rely on assistance and that my safety was at risk. Rising to my feet, I continued forward, trying to find a way out of this eerie forest. Every time I thought I had found a trail, it led either to a dead end or a dangerous area. A sense of despair and helplessness overcame me with the thought that I might never escape this place. Hearing the rustling of branches and the whisper of leaves behind me, I immediately turned around and saw a huge creature in the darkness. Its silhouette resembled a bear, but it had antlers on its head, resembling moose antlers, large and imposing. My heart froze with fear, and I realized that I needed to act immediately. Instinctively, I started running. The unknown creature was chasing me, and I could feel its hot breath on my back. I knew that if it caught up to me, I would have to fight for my life with whatever means I had. I ran as fast as I could, but I felt the beast closing the distance between us relentlessly. Panic engulfed me, and I felt utterly defenseless in the face of this unknown threat. Suddenly, my legs stumbled, and I fell, hitting my head on a rock. Consciousness left me, and I descended into the darkness of unconsciousness. When I finally came to, the creature was no longer beside me. Glancing around, I tried to recall the recent events and understand my current situation. Getting up with difficulty, I surveyed the gloom surrounding me. Not knowing how much time I had spent unconscious, I felt a headache and found a small wound. Realizing that my flashlight had been lost in the confusion, I felt a greater sense of helplessness as I was left without a source of light in this insane forest. Beginning my search in the hope of remembering where I might have dropped the flashlight, I stumbled upon something entirely different. A backpack. Opening it, I found food, water, and a compass. This unexpected find filled me with both surprise and joy. However, it also raised questions. Who could have left it here? It made me think that perhaps I wasn't alone in this forest. Deciding to use the compass, I started moving in the direction it indicated taking cautious steps to avoid getting lost in the darkness or encountering anything dangerous. It seemed like I walked for an eternity, losing hope of finding a way out. But suddenly, I saw a light ahead. Approaching the light, I discovered a road in front of me. A feeling of relief and joy overwhelmed me, and I continued along the road, hoping to find help soon. After several hours of walking, I reached a small town. My condition was far from ideal. I was badly injured and exhausted, but luckily, I was alive. I managed to reach the local police station, and there I learned some shocking news. First, I found myself in a different state, thousands of miles away from my hometown and the national park. Second, I had been declared missing, as my search had continued for over two months. Third, 
there had been a fire at my house in the woods, which had raged for several weeks. The fire had been extinguished, but some of my fellow rangers believed that I had perished in the flames. I couldn't understand how I ended up in a completely different state and what had happened to me during those two months. However, it was clear that the connection between the fire at my house and the mysterious creature and light in the forest was not a coincidence. Story 3 I was always drawn to nature in its pristine and untouched form, so the offer to work in a remote nature reserve felt like a gift from destiny. The reserve had been off-limits to the public due to safety concerns, and I was to become the sole ranger on its vast expanse, responsible for protecting the area and studying the wild nature. It was an offer I couldn't refuse. The first days in my new place were pure bliss. I settled into a small but cozy cabin that became my new home. Despite its simplicity and even some austerity, the solitude and the opportunity to be alone with nature felt like true happiness. However, the reserve, with its vast forests, winding rivers, and towering cliffs, was a place where one could get lost not only physically, but also mentally. And though I immersed myself in my work, loneliness gradually crept over me, like a gentle but inevitable fog enveloping me. Longing for human interaction, I realized that it was part of the conditions of my job, but I still couldn't stop desiring some form of companionship. My only companions were the wild inhabitants of the forest and the occasional crackle of the radio when I contacted headquarters. One day, sitting in my cabin with a cup of tea and studying the reserve maps, I heard a sudden buzzing on the radio. The air filled with interference, through which a weak, barely distinguishable voice broke through. Help! I'm lost. I need assistance. I frowned, instinctively gripping the radio tighter. There shouldn't have been anyone else in the reserve, and I couldn't understand how someone had managed to penetrate here. However, despite all my doubts, I couldn't ignore this desperate call for help. Quickly gathering the necessary items, a jacket, a backpack with a first aid kit, water, and a flashlight, I prepared to head out. Knowing that darkness would soon set in, I didn't want to be unprepared. As the sun began to dip below the horizon, its last rays created an eerie glow, piercing through the treetops. I tried to push back the growing sense of unease, focusing solely on the task of search. Periodically, I would stop to call out to the lost individuals, hoping for a response. My voice echoed through the forest, absorbed by the encroaching darkness. When the last light of day faded, a rustling came from the underbrush. I froze, feeling my heart pounding faster. My thoughts raced between the possibility of finding the lost people and the likelihood of encountering another forest inhabitant. Holding my breath, I waited to see what or who would emerge from the darkness. And then, a squirrel leaped out from the bushes, chirping disapprovingly at me. I couldn't help but let out a relieved laugh, feeling the tension leave my shoulders. It was just a squirrel. Giving in to the darkness and old superstitions, I summoned the strength not to let my imagination get the best of me. The moon, like a pink lantern, illuminated the forest trails with long shadows. Turning on my flashlight, I cautiously illuminated the path ahead, occasionally calling out in the hope of any response or sign indicating our proximity to the lost people. But each of my calls seemed to be swallowed by the same deafening silence of the forest. As hope began to fade, I stumbled upon an abandoned campsite with a cold campfire in the center, surrounded by food wrappers and a few belongings. My heart raced with anticipation. This had to be where the missing individuals had been recently. Realizing they couldn't be far, I regained a new determination and continued my search, scrutinizing every sign of human presence. The forest seemed denser and more impenetrable as I ventured deeper, with the darkness feeling like a physical weight on my shoulders. I tried to convince myself that it was all just a product of my imagination, that there was nothing to fear in these woods. But then, I discovered the first part of a body. A severed hand lay in a pool of congealed blood. I recoiled in horror, feeling bile rise in my throat, and my flashlight trembled in my hand, casting chaotic shadows on this horrifying scene. With every fiber of my being, I wanted to turn and run, to forget this nightmare as if I had never seen it. But I knew I couldn't give up. In the forest, there were still lost and frightened people relying on me. I was their only hope. Summoning all my willpower, I pushed the horror aside and continued my search with newfound determination. As I progressed, I discovered more body parts scattered throughout the forest. 
the horror seemed to grip every cell of my body. But my resolve was stronger. I understood my duty to those unfortunate souls who had become lost in this cursed place, and I was ready to see it through, regardless of my personal risks. The forest grew darker and more oppressive with every step, engulfing me in a deep silence and a vague sense of fear. The wind continued to whisper through the trees, and the eerie hissing grew louder and more insistent, as if the forest itself was coming to life around me. Trying to convince myself that it was just a product of my imagination, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me, preparing to strike at the most inopportune moment. I detected barely perceptible movements, heard rustling in the underbrush, and felt as though something was always nearby, eluding my peripheral vision. My breath seemed too loud, each exhale echoing through the silence like a scream, cutting through the darkness. In desperation to maintain some semblance of control, I attempted to contact my superiors to report my findings and the strange occurrences, but my radio, my only reliable means of communication in these desolate expanses, suddenly failed me. It became utterly useless, leaving me alone and isolated amidst the impenetrable darkness and uncertainty. Each new step felt like a descent into the realm of the unknown terror, where an ancient malevolent force seemed to do everything in its power to isolate me from the rest of the world. Continuing my search, I encountered horrifying evidence of the tragedies that befell the lost travelers. Body parts scattered throughout the forest created a gruesome tableau of cruelty and destruction that froze my heart with fear. I couldn't fathom what could have caused such carnage, but I was determined to find out, fully aware that the lives of people depended on my actions. With every step, the forest grew darker and more menacing. I tried to ignore the mounting dread, focusing on the mission, but denying the obvious became increasingly difficult. In these woods, there truly was something malevolent, ancient, and cunning. My flashlight seemed to dim with each passing moment, its feeble light barely penetrating the all-encompassing darkness. While I attempted to convince myself that it was just due to depleted batteries, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was trying to extinguish the last flicker of light in my hands. As I delved deeper into the heart of the forest, the strange tracks I had noticed became even more mysterious leading me further into the labyrinth of trees. With each step, my fear intensified. The inability to explain the origin of these tracks only added to my terror. I sensed something always nearby, eluding my sight. My teeth chattered from the tension. I pressed on, fervently praying to find the survivors. My breathing felt unnaturally loud, each exhale echoing in the silence like a scream that cleaved through the darkness. Trying to convince myself that the tracks in front of me belonged to a forest dweller, I couldn't deny the inner feeling that something dreadful was hunting me, choosing its moment to strike. The moon, rising high in the sky, bathed the landscape in an eerie light, casting shadows that played on the forest floor, creating ominous shapes. The wind's whisper through the tree canopies almost sounded like soft but sinister words, adding a mystical atmosphere to my journey. As I continued my search, I emerged into a small clearing with a circle of charred stones at its center. The air around the circle seemed heavy and laden with an inexplicable weight. It defied logical explanation, but I had an intuitive sense that I had found a pivotal location, the epicenter of the malevolence shrouding this accursed forest. Deep within the heart of the forest, I discovered the remains of the missing individuals. It was a shocking sight, confirming my worst fears that something truly horrifying and incomprehensible was present here. The scattered belongings, clothing remnants, and the very stones themselves created a tableau resembling an ancient ritual or sacrifice, leaving me with even more questions about what I was dealing with. The scene that unfolded before me was so gruesome that it evoked profound despair. Bodies, cruelly dismembered and strewn throughout the forest, resembled pieces of a macabre exhibition in a museum. Tears of impotent rage and sorrow welled up in my eyes at the sight but I summoned the strength to compose myself. I needed to escape from here, to leave this accursed forest. In my attempt to find a way out, I began to notice a fleeting creature pursuing me from a distance. It was a monstrous entity, resembling a half-bear, half-human being, like a living embodiment of one of the ancient legends about witches guarding this forest. My heart froze with fear as our eyes met. The fear that had simmered within me flared anew, prompting me to seek refuge in flight. However, the creature was incredibly fast, and I soon realized that I couldn't outrun it. 
Its unnatural speed and agility shattered my last illusions of escape. With a primal scream, I confronted the entity, determined to drive it back into the dark depths from whence it came. The witch let out a menacing roar, slashing with its enormous razor-sharp claws. I narrowly avoided its attack, my heart pounding furiously, adrenaline coursing through my entire body. Realizing that I would lose in a direct confrontation, I had to find a way to outsmart the monster. My plan was to lure the witch into a trap, granting me the opportunity to escape the forest and return with help to confront this evil once and for all. With this goal in mind, I initiated a desperate maneuver, drawing the creature's attention and leading it behind me. My ranger training and instincts helped me stay one step ahead, despite the constant threat that it might catch up to me at any moment. The darkness seemed to envelop the forest even more, and the wind twisted through the trees as if encouraging the witch to launch new attacks. My life hung by a thread as I reached the location designated for the trap, a deep hidden ravine cutting through the forest underbrush. Balancing on the brink of desperation, I led the witch to the edge of the ravine and, at the last moment, dodged aside, forcing the creature to plummet into its depths. Holding my breath, I watched as it thrashed and emitted menacing cries while its monstrous form was gradually consumed by the darkness below. I knew this was only a temporary measure but it provided me with the time I had desperately sought to escape the forest and summon help. With a heavy heart, I moved away from the edge of the chasm, beginning my long journey back to civilization. The darkness felt less oppressive, as if the forest had reluctantly released its hold on me. The wind continued to whisper, but the ominous hissing had given way to a mournful wailing that echoed through the night. Returning, I reflected on the fates of those who were lost, realizing that I had done everything in my power to save them, even though I couldn't prevent their tragic end. Exiting the forest and greeted by the first rays of dawn, I understood that my ordeal was not yet over. Gathering a group of hunters, police, and volunteers, we returned to the forest in search of answers. However, our efforts proved futile. Neither the creature nor any traces of it were found. Many began to doubt my account, suspecting it to be a fabrication. Yet, I knew the truth. The half-bear, half-witch still lurked in the shadows, biding its time. This experience was deeply etched into my consciousness, a reminder that the world is full of unknown threats, and even the most bizarre stories can turn out to be true.